Let me read for you this text. It's a familiar text, and I know we've been here, but now we're coming, we're coming to it for another reason, and that's, uh, it's found in Genesis 2 and verse uh, 18. And then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I'll make him a helper fit for him. Now, just to remind you, that's not so much a relational statement, because Adam had fellowship with God. Therefore, there's no inadequacies in his life. This has to do with the mandate he's given him. And that mandate is to be fruitful and fill the earth, to subdue the creation and to rule over the creation and subdue the earth. And there was no way that he could do this without a suitable helper. And it was not good for him to be alone in light of that call that God had placed upon him. So, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. In other words, he was naming them. That's his authoritative role as the vice regent over creation, defining them, naming them. But there was not a suitable Helper. And then the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with the flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Many have said, and rightly so. He didn't take her from his head, she's not over him, or his feet, she's not under him, but from his side to fit, to complete, to come alongside of him. It's also, I think, appropriate, as Matthew Henry has pointed out, that he comes, he, the woman was made from that place closest to his heart, that he might nourish her and cherish her. And so the man and the Lord and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is last, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Let me read that last verse again. Verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They shall become one. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God abides forever. By his grace and mercy, may his word be preached for you. Please be seated. The last time I preached on the family, so a series on the family on, and on parenting, I had children at home. That was a very, very challenging time in your life when you're parenting children. In fact, the last time I preached on this, they were all in high school and I did a series on parenting. I think I was doing the series more to instruct myself than anyone else, to be honest with you, because of the challenges that I knew would be faced even in that day and time, those years, and that some time ago. Uh, I have dealt with the subject from time to time, but not as a series, and I'm going to propose to you that this, <clears throat> now let me remind you where we are. We are in a series uh, called Foundations from Genesis because we're in this series for a very specific reason. And that reason is, is we live in an age in which the foundations are being shaken. You're living in an age where no longer is the culture an ally uh, for, for biblical principles and, and biblical institutions and biblical concepts. Because of the work of the gospel in years past in our culture, uh, the first awakening, the second great awakening, the revivals that have taken place in the 20th century, there were a lot of deposits that were made in the culture from Christianity that you could pretty well call upon. Now, some of them could be misused and, be, uh, and, um, and give the wrong idea of Christianity as it worked its way through the culture, but you know, I still remember in high school, I, we went to high school, I, I grew up in a high school that uh, we had an honor code. When, 
when tests were given, now this is a public high school, when tests were given, the teachers left the room and we were expected to police ourselves. Uh, we had a student, um, um, a student disciplinary board. Uh, there were no locks in the school whatsoever. No lockers had any locks on them at all. And uh, it was really, an, um, uh, it was just an amazing time. But we, of course, we had a principal uh, that um, reminded us time after time you can still hear D.K. Pittman to this day. In fact, I recently went to a, 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 um, a reunion of our high school, and we, everyone, when we walk in, we all said, remember who you are and where you're from. And he said, you will not embarrass me. Uh, that's what he would remind us of. And, um, and he was really an, an amazing man. Uh, leadership really counts. It really does, and it did, and we were blessed by it. I mean, schools from all over the United States would come and visit just to see what was taking place and, and how it was done. It was really a, an interesting time, and, and I, I remember not only being in a high school like that, but I can remember driving out with my parents, and we're going on some trip somewhere to see a relative, and and then all of a sudden, my mother says, uh-oh, I forgot to lock the door. And Daddy said, oh, that's okay. Well, I mean, when I moved to Miami, I'll know you didn't walk to the car without locking the door. And so uh, it was really a, a, quite the experience that, uh, uh, that I was blessed with. And so I'm, I'm grateful for all of those things that uh, in that high school setting, I remember every morning started with a devotion. Uh, we had a Jewish, uh, a Jewish um, council, and we had a, a Christian uh, council, and they would take turns each day. And the Jewish folks would read from the Old Testament, and the, and the Christians would read from Old and New Testament. It was really an interesting experience that was there. And so there were allies that you could call upon in the culture uh, as Christians, and um, that's pretty much, that's disappearing rapidly. Uh, even where we have um, recently, there was a, uh, a, an interesting study, and the, uh, the place with the most knowledge of Bible investigated through a survey from a secular organization was Birmingham, uh, Alabama. It's really interesting. Uh, but even here, you can sense it. Uh, while I was gone, um, people said, oh, I heard y'all ran into trouble. There was no trouble in Israel, believe me. I think they, they let y'all see one march and somebody got in a fight, but uh, um, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I'm over there in a nation that we see as a hot spot, and there were 33 murders there last year. It doesn't take us long to cover that in Birmingham, does it? Uh, so, folks, we're seeing a culture that's in a death spiral. And as a pastor, and as one who loves you, and one who wants you uh, to understand the foundations that God has established, I know we don't have many allies to call on out there. Not you can't get it from journalism. You can't even, I mean, used to, you could maybe take a look at a television program that would try to incorporate some basic issues that are rooted in Christian virtue, but um, it would be embarrassing almost to produce something like that now. Uh, articles, essays, uh, TV, movies, all of that, the, the popular culture, even the performing arts, and all, so there aren't those many allies. Thus, Thus, series like this become important. We've got looked at the, from the book of Genesis, we've looked at the sanctity of creation. We've looked at the sanctity of, um, the sanctity of God, the sanctity of man, the sanctity of gender, male and female. We've looked at the sanctity of sexuality. And, um, and we have looked at the sanctity of, uh, and now we're looking at the sanctity, we looked at the sanctity of marriage. And we looked at the sanctity of singleness. And now we look at the, what does the Bible say in this foundational book, this blueprint for life, the book of Genesis. What does it say concerning family and parenting? Well, here's what I propose to do. I propose to, first of all, tonight, just to start at, at um, kind of course level one. You know, one of the things we've done with each one of this is when we've looked at whether, no matter what sanctity we've looked at, we've said, what does it say in terms of creation, 
fall and redemption. And that's what I propose to do tonight, is to lay down a groundwork about family and parenting by first of all taking a look, what does it say from creation? What do, and what, how does the fall affect what God created? And then what has God given us in redemption? Just open that up. And then in the next three Sunday nights that we have together in this text, I propose to take you to three key texts of Scripture. One is Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 and verses 1 through 4. Another one is Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 1 through 4. And then another one is Luke chapter 2. Um, how would you like to have parented Jesus? I don't know about you, but on the one hand, I'd love to have parented Jesus. Uh, on the other hand, um, I wouldn't have had to figure out what do I do for discipline. I wouldn't have had to do that because he never sinned in thought, word, or deed. Uh, so I, um, I wouldn't have had to worry about that. But on the other hand, <laughs> how does the incarnate Son of God, how do you raise him? And there are some basic principles from the parenting of Joseph and Mary that I want you to see. So those are the three texts, Luke 2, Deuteronomy 6, Ephesians 6. And then to, the, tonight, just getting started from this creation text uh, to take a look at some foundational issues about family and parenting. First of all, from creation, then from the fall, and then from redemption. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at it, first of all, uh, from these uh, principles. And if you'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a, uh, of a definition to start with. Uh, here's the first definition I would give to you. The definition is our um, one man, here's the family in, ver in terms of creation. It's one man united to one woman for life in the covenant of marriage with parental responsibility to raise our children uh, to leave us and to establish their own family for God's glory. Now, there's a lot that's in there that you can't miss. In creation, how did God set this up? Now, we have got sin has not produced the problem yet, but so we've got creation. So from Genesis 2, 2 and verse 24 that I read, what do we learn? Well, family starts with a marriage. One man, one woman, one life, united in a covenant of marriage. Well, pastor, in that verse you read, it really doesn't say anything about children. No, it doesn't, but it anticipates them. Because what does the text say? The text says that for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. Well, if a man is leaving his father and mother, what does that tell you? There's a family. There's a family. Now, starting with Adam and Eve, we don't have a family yet. We will. But what God was putting in place was the basic institution of creation, family. And let me just say something here, just as clearly as I can. With what our culture is doing to decimate, destroy, redefine, and, um, and literally pervert the concept of family, no nation can stand for long. You just can't do it. God created us, and God created us to live in the context of family. The bottom course in a family is a husband and a wife, a covenant of marriage. And that is where sexuality belongs. And sexuality initiates the marriage, sexuality recreates the marriage, and sexuality provides procreation from the, from the marriage. Thus, you now have a son and a daughter. They do what? They leave. They leave to cleave. So for this cause, a man. What man? A man that will come from this family. A man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And the two shall become one. So here, what is assumed? Now, it is assumed that built into the culture of humanity, made in the image of God, is the ability to have a relationship of intimacy, so intimate that it is described as one plus one equals one. Physically, biologically, sexually, spiritually, one plus one equals one. That the two become one. 
And then out of that comes, comes children. And the children that are there, what do they do? They leave. So now do you see the definition? Why I've got the definition up there? You've got Adam and Eve, but the expectation is now they can multiply and fill the earth. How do you multiply and fill the earth? Through the family structure. That there is a marriage, and then when you have the children, the children leave that family to start their family as they cleave together. Thus, a man united to a, a woman for life in the covenant of marriage with parental responsibilities to what? To raise their children to do what? To leave them. Can I just stop here in anticipation of the next three Sunday nights? That is one of our gigantic problems, particularly from my generation. We raised our children to cleave to us because we were getting our significance from them. Look at the bumper stickers whereby we brag on them, whereby we brag on ourselves. Is that instead of raising our children to leave us, we actually raised our children to depend upon us because we were dependent upon them being dependent upon us. I think the boomer generation has, uh, I, I don't like to use sociological terms, but I can speak about it because I was at the beginning of it when I was born. And, um, and I think that um, we turned it into something that was uh, very self-oriented uh, self and self-absorbed and even parenting was uh, put together in terms of that concept. Um, I remember <laughs> we're talking with my dad and my mom, and I remember when I was just finishing high school, and they said to me, well, uh, well you're going to college, right? Yes, sir. I'm trying to go to school, try to play baseball. I'm going to go to college. Okay. And, uh, and my dad said, I hope you do well. I'm going to help you with the tuition as long as you're there. But I, and well, in this case, the expenses, as long as you're there. <clears throat> and, uh, but I want you to know, if you're not doing your job, then you come home and go to work, son. And I said, okay. And, uh, and it was, the expectation was, I was supposed to leave. They had raised me to leave. That was the expectation. Well, it wasn't being mean. It was, we raised you to leave. And that's what you're supposed to do. And then the, um, and so you leave and you cleave, and then as you leave and you cleave, there your children, you, that you can't do that unless your parenting has been purposed to that, to give them the skills. Now, I can go to the sociologist to substantiate all that I've just said. It's very, and the sociologists tell us in the 19, in the 1970s, the age of puberty was 14, and the age of adolescence was 18. Today, puberty is 11. It's gone down. Adolescence is 26. Adolescence means having the skills to be able to function in life. 26. Just by a secular analysis, that all of a sudden we have added 10 years to being able to function in society, to care for yourself, to establish relationships, to establish a family. Uh, all of those things have disappeared. We've got more technology than we've ever had before. We've got all kinds of things available. What's happened? Well, I think what's happened is in parenting, we have created cocoons for children to be dependent upon us instead of the skills to leave us because we have become dependent upon them being dependent upon us. Well, that's what's supposed to happen, that they leave us, and so we raise them to leave us, so they establish their own families to fulfill God's calling in their life. 
And when they establish that family, then we have a relationship with them. Now, again, I've said this back before, but let me say it again because it fits right here. Uh, I have the great privilege to do premarital counseling. And one of the things I try to sit down with them is explain. I know what's going to be said, and that is this. We're not losing a son. We're gaining a daughter. Or we're not losing a daughter. We're gaining a son. I understand why we say that. I understand the feelings behind that. I'm not trying to be preacher Scrooge on this. But I do have to speak to that. And the fact is, if that's the case, that marriage doesn't have a chance. They've got to leave you. They've got to leave to cleave. You can't cleave until you leave. In other words, they're no longer a part of your immediate family. And if you love them, you make sure of that. No, you're leaving. Now, you can get it done a couple of ways. One was, uh, one was my dad and mom just said, praise the Lord, you're going to get married. That's good. Here's how we'll help you get started. And uh, have a go at it. And we're right here for you. Now, my wife, her mother was not all that excited about her daughter's choice. And that was, um, <laughs> and if there was ever a woman with great insight, it was her. Uh, I loved Clara Miller, grew to love her very much. She was a very no-nonsense German uh, woman. Um, I remember the first time I, met, I went to their house to eat when I was courting Cindy, and um, when I was just turning on the charm, at least I thought I was, and uh, so we sat down to the meal to eat, and I and it was a meal I'd never had before. Uh, it was a German meal of scalloped potatoes and pork chops fixed somehow. I couldn't figure it out. And when I took a bite, I said, oh, Mrs. Miller, this is hot, but it's delicious. My goodness, it's hot. And I remember her looking at me and said, well, son, if you've been in the oven for 480 degrees, don't you think you'd be hot too? Well, I knew this was a no-nonsense woman. I was going to have to find another way to win her uh, to, uh, to somehow in, um, approving of me. But, uh, but I remember her statement to her daughter. I love you. And uh, on January the 26th, when you walk out the door and it shuts, it shuts. Go make that marriage work. Go make it work. Now, I am sure if disaster, total disaster, had fallen upon her daughter, I'm sure she would have certainly taken care of her. But what she was trying to communicate is that this is your marriage. You're getting married. That's what you're doing. You're leaving. And if there was ever anyone prepared uh, to leave, it was my wife. And, um, but she, her mother was abundantly clear. My parents were clear to us about that. And so that this is something that's being, I under, I under, again, I understand what we're trying to say in all of this, but you have got to let your children leave. That's why I know, and I know the people that are having the biggest problem, every marriage, I know. <laughs> I know the father of the bride is having the biggest problem, and the, the only one close is the mother of the groom. Those are the two. Now, the father of the, of the groom, praise the Lord, he's out of here. The, the mother of the daughter, well, honey, you probably could have chosen better, but let's get started. And, uh, but the father of the bride, no, that's why we got all the jokes about it. That's why they make movies about it, because he knows he, at least he better know I am no longer number one man in my daughter's life. I can't be. For the sake of this marriage, I must not be. There's another man that's there. And that's the one she cleaves to, not me. That's why I give her. And that's why the mother of a groom has, has got to understand I'm no longer the number one woman in his life. I can't be. I must not be. He must cleave to her. That must be true. 
But you can't get there if you haven't parented there. So how do we get there? And how do we move to that point? Let me give you a second thing to consider in this. And these are just basic, uh, working from creation, um, is, is to realize now sin comes into the world. And when sin comes into the world, guess what else comes? Now brokenness. Now instead of a man and a woman, now there is the potential for unfaithfulness and there's divorce or there's a death and now you have a widow or a widower and now you've got a single parent and now you've got children who are born with a sin nature. And how are you going to deal with that? Even as we go to Genesis and we see Cain and Abel, and now death enters in because of anger and because of a broken relationship with the Almighty. All of those things that now come into play. So what, so what do we need to say about, now notice my adjective, Christian parenting. Parenting in creation is you have your children and you raise them to leave you for God's glory. But now sin has come. What does that do to the matter of family and parenting? Well, here's what I've written out for you. A parental commitment to nurture. This is what Christian parenting is. A parental commitment to nurture. Please get these three words. They're going to keep coming back in the next three Sunday nights. It is a commitment to nurture evangelize and disciple your covenant children in the context of the covenant community, Christ Church, according to God's covenant promises, guided by biblical precepts, relying on the grace of God so that we raise children who can enjoy God, can enjoy God and glorify Him forever. That's where we want to I understand it's not a bumper sticker, but this is just something from a definition I want to work with you. Evangelize and disciple. To nurture, here's a home. This isn't a house. The parents have made it a home. It's really and truly a home. And in that home that we have nurtured, and how do you nurture so that a child in that home grows in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with man? That nurturing dynamic that we're going to lay out in the coming weeks. For what purpose? To evangelize your child. You are evangelizing your child. We're not just teaching our children, here's what good Christians do. In that case, what we've done is raise a Pharisee. No, we go after the heart first. We go after the heart. You need Christ. Parenting is evangelism. Then it's discipleship. Because when Christ gets hold of the heart, the life changes. I couldn't help but think this morning as uh, Rob was preaching from Ephesians 3, that great doxology that ends the first section of Ephesians where uh, it tells us who we are in Christ. For three chapters, all of the blessings that God has secured for the elect in Christ are given in those three chapters. And then he ends with the doxology that was so ably expounded for us this morning. And then he goes to chapter 4, therefore, now, now here is the life that blesses God because of the blessings that God has secured for you in Christ. Here's what the blessings of God are in Christ for the elect, and here's how the elect live to bless their God from whom all blessings have flowed to us. And for he says, I urge you, therefore, to, um, I urge you as a prisoner of the Lord that you walk in a manner worthy of your calling. 
having. And then he looks at your personal life, how to put off and put on. And then he looks at the church life. And then he looks at the worship life. And then he looks at the, and then he turns to the marriage in Ephesians chapter 5. Here's how a Christian husband loves his wife and nurtures her and sacrifices for her and leads her with a servant's heart. And here's a Christian woman who is now a Christian wife who comes alongside. She doesn't compete with him. She's not, um, uh, she comes right alongside of him to become one with him. And so as she submits to him and honors him and respects him, and the two become one functioning together with the mind of Christ, then he immediately moves to the, to the family. And what does it mean to parent, which is where we're moving next week in Ephesians chapter 6. But what do you get here? Here's what you get. You do, now, what, follow this, please. You don't get better to get blessed with salvation. You don't go get better to get blessed. I'm going to be a better man. I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to be a better father. I'm going to be a better business person. And then I'm going to, come, so I can come to Christ and become a Christian. No, you come to Christ helpless and hopeless, just as I am. He takes you right where you are. Ephesians 1 through 3. But he never leaves you where you are. Ephesians 4 through 6. And when he changes you, he not only changes you, he changes you from the inside out. And when he changes you from the inside out, now he changes relationships. He changes, your, first of all, your relationship with him in a daily walk with him. Then he changes your marriage relationship. Then he changes your your family relationship. Then he changes your employer-employee relationships. And then he changes you as his as a as a warrior in the hands. I mean, I'm sorry, as a uh, as an instrument in the hands of the divine warrior. As you enter into spiritual warfare to serve Christ in this world to rescue the perishing. He changes you, and if there's any one area, he certainly changes you. It's in a marriage, it's in parenting, it's in family. Isn't it wonderful that how God, again, I'm going to be repeating this. Isn't it wonderful how God has taken the institution of creation, the family, and the institution of redemption, the church, the family of God, and he has entwined them together with his covenant promises so that the one blesses the other and the other blesses the other and that the two work together in such a glorious and wonderful way to be able to see that raising our children in the context of the covenant community as we walk with the Lord and serve the Lord and follow the Lord now, why is it that all of this is so crucial? Why is it so important? Let me give you five reasons tonight why this is so important. I'm just going to enumerate them for you because we'll be coming back to them. But again, I want to get them in front of you. Five reasons why this is important. I've already anticipated one, but let me give, you, uh, let me give them to you in this way. First of all, you have no cultural... Out this series is so important. It is so important to teach what God's Word says about parenting because there are, there are fewer and fewer allies in the culture at large to assist us. I thank the Lord if you were raised in a Christian family and could learn things from your father and mother. I know I did. I learned so many things from my father and mother. I just wished I'd paid attention before I started paying attention. But I praise the Lord for what you can learn from uncles and aunts and grandparents. I praise the Lord for all of that. But what I want to, what I want to, I want to press to us. What I want to press to us is simply this. I want to press to us that you don't have these allies. You live in a culture that is no longer penetrated by the salt of Christianity, by the light of Christianity. 
Harry, why? I can tell you why. Because the only place that the salt is, is made salty and the only place the light shines is from Christ's church into this world. And Christ's church has lost its way. We no longer have God-centered worship. We now f formulate, evaluate, and populate man-centered entertainment. And therefore, we don't have God-centered worship. And worship sets the template for life. If you don't have God-centered worship, you won't have God-centered living. The two just work together. No longer, now the pulpits are silent. Now we don't deal with the tough subjects any longer from God's Word. We no longer do discipleship. That's just not there. And because it's not there, then from the church, we're not sending out people that are salt of the earth and light of the world. We're not sending out people who know how to biblically, not culturally, but biblically in the culture, walk humbly with God, do justice and love mercy. We're no longer sending out people that understand whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, how to do it for the glory of God. We're no longer discipling so that, um, so that in all things, Christ might have preeminence in our life and the result is the church no longer is the thermostat in fact if anything the church is more of a thermometer of the culture than it is a thermostat in the culture and therefore the culture is constantly seeking to press us into its mold constantly we live in a culture of insanity a culture of absurdity, a culture of lethality. We put to death the most helpless if they're inconvenient or unwanted, either at the womb or at the end of life. We live in a culture of insanity. We live in a, as we redefine family and marriage. We we live in a culture of absurdity whereby we pay people to do surgical destruction of bodies and call it gender reassignment. We do chemical destruction and call it gender blocking. We have a society of insanity, a society of absurdity, a society of lethality, and a society that embraces immorality and mocks any notion that sex is a gift from God within marriage of a man and a woman. And all of that is rooted in profitability. We don't have allies in the culture. I thank God for what's still left over here where I have the great privilege. The psalmist, I quote the psalmist constantly and I'm grateful for where I live and serve Christ. But it's coming here as well. The lines of life have fallen to me in a goodly place. I have a godly heritage and I'm grateful for all that's around. I'm grateful for Brother Brian walking the streets and praying years ago and then God bringing preachers into this city such as uh, Dr. Vignel, uh, Dr. Carter, Dr. Barker, and others. I'm grateful that to some degree that spirit of, of revival blessings continue. Think of our own Wales Goebel and others that God has used so much that they make movies about it. And I'm thankful for that. But man, if you step outside of this and even what you see coming into this, there, oh, we don't have cultural allies. I can't just say, well, listen, we'll send them to school, we'll send them to this, we'll send them to that, and they'll pick up what it means to be, what it means to parent. Just can't do it. But on the other hand, on the other hand, 
There's no place else to pick up biblical parenting than from the scriptures in the context of Christ's community, his church. And when churches attempt to do it, the people's ears would much rather be tickled rather than to do the work of discipleship. And then we wonder what went wrong. We had them baptized. Well, what happened next? What happened at night in the home? What happened on the Lord's Day in terms of priorities? What happened in conversations around the dinner table? Those are the basic things that the culture, you can't pick up from it any longer. And so we, we have to, uh, we need to address it. And because we can't depend on other people coming in and, oh, there's a good TV program. I can't find it. Oh, there's a good movie. Well, my goodness, they're, if they're there, they're few and far between. Um, sure not going to Disney for it. So we need to do the hard work of discipleship to build in families. But let me give you a second thing, nor can we even depend on the church at large. This last week I did a program on Today in Perspective. I did a program on Today in Perspective on a Barna. Now, Barna does good. I don't always agree with Barna's solution, but Barna does good research. And he did a survey of, now listen to me carefully, evangelical churches. And in the survey, the verdict was less than 37 percent of the pastors have a biblical world view. The questions were on creation, marriage, gender, family, parenting, salvation, Christ, doctrine of God. Those were basic questions of pastors in pulpits and less than 37% had a competent, passable world in life view. We have even fewer, we even have allies, we even have lost allies within the church. So in the culture, you've got secular progressivism. What, please remember this word. Whenever you hear the word progressive in our setting today, secular progressivism and within the church, you have a religious progressive Christianity, progressive secularism in the culture, progressive, Christ, progressive Christianity, which is serving as a handmaiden to the culture. There's, whenever you hear the word progressive, just jot this word down, deconstruction. Progressive secularism is deconstructing every institution, every foundational institution in the culture. And progressive Christianity is playing the lapdog and redefining marriage, redefining sexuality, removing, removing the declarations of God's, abomin of God's statements of abomination upon sexuality outside of marriage. Let the marriage bed be held in honor among all for fornicators, sexual promiscuity and perversity, and adulterers, God will judge. We don't even warn people that sin has judgment attached to it. So we lost the allies in the culture. We've lost the allies in the church. We have no recourse within the church. And thirdly, but thirdly, does that not present for us an unbelievable opportunity to build God-centered, strong, Christ-exalting marriages and families? What a glorious opportunity. It doesn't get lost in the sentimentality of family movies or family television shows. Now, I'm, I listen, I, I know Mayberry, um, I'm Andy Griffith. My goodness, I grew up in North Carolina. Saint Andy, I know all about him. Of course, I find it interesting. Everybody says, oh, we need to go watch the Andy Griffith show. Well, all right. For what? Well, to learn about family. Well. If you go watch it, nobody was married in the show. 
Uh, now don't sit here and do a catalog. I'm just, you go home and look it up. Nobody was married. But it was old town uh, values and everything. Okay. But folks, listen, we have just this enormous opportunity within the church right now for elders to get into our congregational communities and start shepherding and discipling, for small groups to start looking at this, you know, for us to have the conference on marriage and parenting that would be a, a refuge and an opportunity each and every year. We have this opportunity before us. Now, the tendency is, is because the bubble hasn't totally burst in the city of Birmingham, the tendency is for us just to keep going along. We can't do that. We have got to take the time to take a look at what does it mean to disciple God's people in how you develop a Christian man, a Christian woman, a Christian marriage, and Christian family, and Christian parenting. And that will present an unbelievable witness to the world that will continue in its death spiral. It's circling the drain right now. But if we could just do that, what an, uh, what, an, what an attractive statement whereby people could come and say, how come your marriages, they're not perfect, but how come they're different? Your families, they're not perfect, but they're different. How come, how is that happening? Even with everything going on around you, grace is greater than sin. How is that happening? Oh, we would love to tell you. It's Jesus. And God's grace is greater than our sin. Let me give you a fourth thing. A fourth thing is this is an opportunity for us to bring focus to our discipleship. And I make no apologies for it. I want to do evangelism. I want to do apologetics, how to defend the faith. I want to do all of that. But I do believe, folks, it's no accident <laughs> that our elders put in place a structural change so that we give attention to families and even developing a pastoral position as Jay was sharing with us today so that these things can be integrated together and we can intentionally address these matters Instead of it's going to be glitz and show and smoke machines and worship and this and that and the other, we're going to get into God's Word. We're going to disciple. We want to get small group discipleship. We want to get God-centered worship. And we want to take time to build the family, reaching out into the singles in our church to love them well and experiencing the blessings of their love in our life and in our families, and then together as Christian families, establish families, not families that go off and leave singles behind, but families that wrap them in and families that are blessed by them, but families that are being established with marriages that are in Christ and for Christ. In other words, a congregational community that honors the creation institution of the family while establishing all of the blessings of the diversity within the family of God as sinners are being saved from all kinds of dynamics in life and then coming to Christ and now growing together in the Lord. This is a marvelous opportunity for it. I confess to you, I don't know whether it, I don't know what it is in my life, but I confess to you that I pray and pray and pray, God, will you bring a spark of hunger for your word and a hunger to order our lives, our marriages, and our families once again according to the word. Please liberate us from this. Let me get enough church to get by each month. Now, maybe I can work a Sunday in every once in a while. And, and by the way, I want my church to be sure and, uh, you know, give me, uh, coach me up for three points in a story and let me leave there. Instead of the hard work of killing sin and loving Jesus, winning people to Christ and discipling so that marriages and families are being framed with the Word of God and filled with the Spirit of God. That is the desperate need of the day. And then finally, finally, not only 
Is, this an, is there a culture that you cannot depend on, a religious community that is silenced as it serves the progressive deconstruction movements in society? And it's an unbelievable opportunity for a witness before Christ and before a watching world that as much as they whistle in the dark are desperately wanting to know, is there something deeper, wider, higher, and further? Is that there? And this wonderful opportunity to focus our discipleship in building families in and for Christ within the context of the diversity of the family of God with singles and married folks working together in and for Christ. But finally, just think of the witness that this would present to a world where people are serious about Jesus, they're serious about the Word of God, and they're serious about loving people who are not yet serious about Jesus. What would that look like? And what would that look like to see families on these trajectories of growing in grace? I remember when I was a youth pastor, and I remember the, cruel, the, the sudden awakening I had. God visited the youth group where I served him in Rossville, Georgia, while I was at Covenant College. God visited that youth group with amazing, amazing uh, blessings. And I remember first getting called into the pastor's office, <laughs> and he said to me, um, Ike, that was my nickname, I hadn't grown up yet, and uh, so he said, Ike, uh, you know, boy, there's a lot of kids coming here, but we're not, you, you're not using the denominational literature. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, was I supposed to? And he said, well, it's just, don't you think it would be a good idea? He said, um, why don't you introduce the denominational literature into the Sunday school? And I said, well, we're, we're studying the book of, I shouldn't have done this. This was so stupid of me. I said, well, we're studying the book of Romans. Isn't Romans part of our denominational literature? I didn't really get a laugh from him at that point at all. Next thing I know, I'm called in by the parents' council. And the bottom line was simply this. We're glad our kids are coming to Bible study on Wednesday night. We're glad they're coming Sunday morning and Sunday night to worship services. And we're glad for um, them meeting you and all of this. We're glad for all of that. But, you know, they're kind of going a little bit overboard. I mean, some of them are talking about an alternative prom. Some of them are talking about going to a Christian college. Some of them are talking about missions. And I began to realize what they really wanted me to do is to produce enough religion to keep their kids from embarrassing them. But if the kids really got excited about Jesus, that was a bridge too far. That's why when I sit out here and I stand, have watch up here and pray and thank God for what I see in the lives of these students, I just rejoice in it. But folks, there's another whole level that we need to seek and to find. And that's why in a watching world, is at stake. But let me give you the biggest reason, and I'll close with this. I actually had some more points, but I'm out of time now, so I'll stop here. Let me close with this. Can I give you another reason why parenting is so important? Every survey I've ever read tells me they have a little bit difference, but not much. 80 to 85 percent of the people that come to Christ come to Christ because of what happens in their life before age 14. 80 to 85 percent. Well, I'm hearing old people can't get saved. Yep, but not many. I mean, how old can you get? Let's go to the deathbed. Only one deathbed conversion in the Scripture, and that Jesus got that one on the cross. Basically, people die the way they live. 
and people continue to live the way they learn to live. Here's what I'm telling you. <laughs> a home that nurtures and a home that gets discipleship has got to be a home where kids are evangelized and they're one to Christ and they're brought to Christ. That perhaps is my biggest burden of all. There are a lot of hopes, and there's, I had five other things to give you, I just don't have time. But I'll get to them, believe me, we're going to get to them. But I'm going to give you one of them right now. If you're here tonight and you're a Christian, can I tell you one of the great blessings you have? You don't have to come and learn how to parent and then perform for God to notice you and bless you because God's already made a promise to you I'll be a God to you and to your children after you your children are holy that does not mean sinless it means set apart when they're in a Christian home Believe on the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved, you and your household. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. It's a promise with the provisions for its fulfillment. I hope to take you through the provisions for its fulfillment, but I'm grateful that we don't have to perform for God to give us a promise. We can parent from God's promise. I'll be with you. I have woven the family into my work of redemption. I work through you. I want to lay out how and what he does through us. And yes, we'll get to best practices but I want to walk through that with you because of our witness to this world and our walk for Christ in this world and for the sake of your children to say no to sin and yes to Jesus and to miss hell and have heaven and to know the joy of living for God's glory and not the emptiness of this world's vain promises. That's what I think is at stake in parenting. And we aren't sufficient, but he is able. Dare I quote from this morning, he is able to do far beyond what we could ask or imagine. Father, thank you for the moments we could be together in your word. Would you receive our thanks for this Lord's Day? Would you receive our praise for all of your glorious blessings that you shower down upon us? Thank you for our marriages. Thank you for our families. Please work in our hearts that we would no longer look to the world for magic potions or the philosophies of this age or live by the spirit of this age but by the Holy Spirit through your word live in the kingdom and God bless us as a family of believers to raise families and love one another well every single one of us no matter where our stations in life no matter what our status in life please do your work in us that you might be, that you, your glorious family would bless families and families would bless the family of God, that the family of God would be a blessing to this world, putting salt to restrain sin and light to bring sinners to the Savior. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.